Good afternoon and welcome to this controller session with the inimitable Ben Frau. Uh, 2016 has certainly been a very busy year for Ben and for the channel. Under his remit, the Channel 5 portfolio looks on course for a record year with younger viewers and it's been evolving, I think it's fair to say, with more aspirational programming, we can come on to that, and moving into new genres, which will be of interest to indies here in um, genres like comedy and entertainment. There's also been the small matter of a rebrand. So welcome, Ben. How would you sum up the past year? Uh, well, the past year has sort of been cementing what I wanted to uh, sort of uh, begin three and a half years ago when I came to the channel. I wanted to make it more diverse. I wanted to build on what I thought was quite a solid channel, if, if a little uh, one note. Um, uh, we talked about trying to build our audience, and I do believe if you want to build your audience, you need to provide a broader range of programmes. I do believe in origination. I wanted to increase commissioning. Um, I wanted to put commissioning at the heart of the schedule at 9 o'clock, so one of the first things we did was move our acquisitions at the time to 10 o'clock. Um, and I think what we have now got are a range of still very successful returning shows, the Yorkshire Vet GPs, Dog Rescuers, Can't Pay, um, Hotel Inspector in its 12th season and still as strong as ever, um, which is fantastic. And that has allowed us to then take risks and do less commercially attractive programmes like The Body Donors or My Name Is and I'm an Alcoholic or Gift of Life. Um, I do believe that as a PSB we should be uh, um, populist and we should be accessible and we should um, obviously uh, attract as big an audience as possible. But we have a responsibility, as I've said before, to take risks, to try new things and to take our audience from what they might naturally expect into new areas. And particularly you're interested in more kind of aspirational programs. Well, I think what we, we've had huge success with, with things like our benefits programs over the last three years. And part of my job is to wake up in the morning and go, you know what, there's been a sea change in the nation, or I think that what, what was, you know, on the front page of every paper every day is no longer there. What are people wanting in nine months' time, in a year's time? What do I think the viewers are going to want to be watching on television? So about, well, I suppose it was about a year ago, really, with the, the launch of Eamon and Ruth took us in a sort of very new direction for Channel 5, and there were a lot of people, most people actually, in Channel 5 who didn't think that it would rate. Um, and I was very nervous, it's the only time I've actually really been nervous at Channel 5 that it might not rate and that I'd kind of lost my touch and then I hadn't lost my touch, I was good as ever <laughs> and <laughs> I was right and they were wrong and, <laughs> and I, I expect you pointed that I out to pointed them that out yes. in no <laughs> uncertain terms um, but I did feel that there was, I, it's quite interesting with Brexit as well I really felt that there was a wave coming of people wanting to take control of their lives that they did not want to be accountable to other people, that they could define their own destiny. So we've got a range of stuff coming through in the next few months, whether it's following people as they build their own hotels or turn their homes into hotels. We follow people as they give up the day job and they sell their houses. It's called starting up, starting over. And they just go for their dream life. I am very interested in the fact that um, Brexit happened because I think it's the whole nation is kind of going, what about Great Britain? But on a micro level, I think it's micro, I think that's how you say it, um, I'm interested in the people who want to define their own destiny. So where we were very successful with our benefits, Nightmare Neighbours, um, Slum Landlords, those kind of programmes, I call them sort of slightly down and dirty programmes, slightly gritty programmes, I do feel that while some of them are still very successful and will continue, there's a new wave coming through which takes us in a much more aspirational direction. But I suppose that is a risk in the sense that the benefits programme have done very well for you in yeah. terms of audience yeah. volume and you move in a new direction. I mean, what's been happening with your audience share? Uh, our audience share for the main channel was slightly down for adults and ABC ones and we're up five for 1634s, which is, I think, quite an achievement. Um, as a family, it's a, been a fantastic year. We're up for ABC ones 4%, up, up adults 4% and up 14% for 1634s. You know, the, the digital channels Five Star and Spike have started commissioning and that is a real sea change for Channel 5. Five Star was always the dumping ground on which, you know, basically anything that had played on Channel 5 would go into Five Star. Um, Gemma and Sebastian, who sort of oversee Five Star, felt very passionately about commissioning their own content. I completely support that. They've had a great strike rate with a number of hit shows which are coming back. Sex Pod, 100% Hotter, um, Kids Who Kill, and, um, and, you know, Five Star is, and, and Spike are both, uh, sorry, Five Star is skewing young and female and has really grown its audience share. So while I, on the main channel, 
try to keep it as relevant and successful and, and forward-looking as possible, there's no denying that the digital channels have increasing importance in terms of targeting those specific demographics. Five USA targets the ABC One viewer, who is worth, I think, four times more than Joe Public. Five Star targets you know, uh, 1634 viewer, who is worth six times Joe Public. And Spike targets all adults. So all our digital channels have a role to play within the bigger picture. But that doesn't mean to say that Channel 5 as the mothership isn't really crucial in terms of growth as well. But I suppose particularly for younger viewers, there's distinctions between the mothership and the other channels are less relevant. Well, I don't know that the young people nowadays really did, uh, you know, are aware of what channel they're watching particularly. I think, I, I, you know, I'm keep, I keep saying this, I feel like a bit of a dinosaur. Um, I do believe in content. And, and I do believe that if you find great content and you commission great content and you've got production companies making you great content, viewers will come. And we have about 10, I'd say about 10 in our portfolio, hit shows. And we have out of those 10, three of them are virtually bulletproof. I mean, it doesn't matter where you play it, on what day, on what time, on what channel, it will get an audience. Um, and interesting, talking to the, you know, the online team, they go, if you get a hit show on Channel 5, that is a hit show online as well. So mm -hmm. I don't know that people and, and, and audiences go, it's an ITV show, or it's an E4 show, or it's a five-star show, or it's a Channel 5 show. Good content will stand out. And really, my job is to try and make sure that we keep getting great content on Channel 5. That's somebody so fine. I just wanted to remind you all that you can use the festival app um, to ask questions, um, which we'll um, probably take at the end, and you can even remain anonymous if you like. Um, so, as I said, I'll be putting them to bed at the end of the session. Um, and this year, in a change to the way these sessions have worked in the past, we're taking questions, you may have seen them in, in other controller sessions, from the video wall. So, um, brace yourself for the great and good in the industry. The first question is from Jane Millichip. <coughs> ben. Has risk-averse commissioning ruined factual television? Uh, oh, golly, no. <laughs> risk-averse television. <coughs> Risk-averse commissioning, but, people being playing too yeah, this safe. Is, this this sort know. of goes back to the old the thing that we discussed in the leaders' debate where somebody said, you know, television is boring. Um, you know, I have a responsibility uh, running Channel 5. You know, we're a commercial channel. We're only as successful as the amount of money that we bring in, blah, 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 blah. Uh, we take risks, but we also have to deliver the numbers. We, all, we have to have those returning foundation pieces that, you know, each week can make sure that we do hit target and that we do make money for the advertisers. Um, I, I, I don't believe that, uh, and I think we all do take risks. I think across channels we all take risks. I, all these people who say that we're not risky, what is defined as a risky project? Is that a project that doesn't rate? Or is that a project that nobody um, says good things about? We do a lot of risky projects. We've got a series coming up called Me and My, which is Me and My Face, Me and My Eating Disorder, Me and My um, Affair, which is risky, you could say, for Channel 5, because uh, it probably won't rate that well. It's very different to what we would normally do. Um, but it's, I think, an important piece of television. You could say the body donors was risky because nobody had ever done it on television before, where we followed people as they died and then donated their bodies to science and were then embalmed and were then dissected. Mm. Um, now, so to the people who sort of say, oh, television is risk averse now. I just think it's too easy to make sweeping statements without understanding the responsibilities that channel controllers across all channels have. You can't just do projects that are so left of field, they are considered a risk, but stand pretty low chance of delivering what you need in order to survive. So it's about balance, as I said this morning. Um, I like to take risks, I like to evolve, and in a way, every new project that a channel does is a risk, because there's no guarantee that anything's going to work, mm. going, to, going to rate. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd be interested to know more about what is the definition of risk from I some suppose, of these people. I suppose what they mean is, is a break away from the kind of formulaic programmes that all feel rather familiar, slightly similar titles, you know, sort of bankable, steady as you go, so... Well, I, well you, need, you need to have a mix of all those, you know, every, every controller wants to have hit shows in their schedule. Every controller wants to have bankers um, that, they, that they can build on and that they can move off from. Um, uh, I've lost my train of thought because you did say something really good there, but I can't remember what it was. <laughs> uh, oh, predictability. And I do think that to a certain extent, you, 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 um, I mean, we've been accused of being copycats, uh, which I've obviously refused, and you may want to come on to that. Mm -hmm. I do think that um, 
when you run a channel, it's a bit like being a fashion designer or, or owning a fashion house. There are trends in fashion. It's red, it's khaki, it's military. And there's no denying, you know, we don't all talk to each other, but I'm sure we all wake up at a certain point and go, you know what, I think adventure is the big thing at the moment. I think we need to have an adventure series which is set on an island. You know, and by osmosis, you suddenly find you've got Bear Grylls here and you've got Bear Grylls there and you've got 10,000 BC here. And, you know, and there are not unsimilarities with some programmes which are reflecting what we believe is the mood of the nation and what people want. So there'll always be an element of similarity because our job is to give viewers what we believe they want to watch at that okay, time. OK, but one person's similarity is another person's copycat, which you were accused well, of. And if you look at, you know, Channel 4 did Benefit Street and then you had your whole kind of... No, 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 no. <laughs> OK. Oh, I'm so <laughs> bored of this question. Uh, no, 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 no disrespect for you, but I have said, we did On Benefits and Proud, which went out in October, and they did Benefits Street, which went out in Fe January or February. Mm. And this is my example. Benefits was everywhere. It was on all the papers. It was the talking issue of the nation. We would have all been remiss not to have reflected benefits in some way on our channels. And as you know, it takes, you know, nine months a year to make a programme sometimes, unless you're doing a quick turnaround. You know, so... Benefits, adventure shows, uh, living history might come back again, and we're suddenly we've all got a living history project. We might all feel that game shows are what our viewers want to watch in autumn 2017, and suddenly you'll go, oh, everyone's doing game shows. It doesn't work like that. Going to Copycat, when I came to the channel, one of my big ambitions for the channel was to reposition it in terms of its uh, uh, in terms of its reputation. Um, I really love Channel 5, and I, I knew it could be a great channel. And I wanted people to look at what we do and go, you know what, hats off to Channel 5, it is a great channel. It would have been short-sighted of me, if not foolish of me, to just copy another programme from another channel and put it on Channel 5. That would devalue all the work I, 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 I'm trying to do. So I can honestly say, hand on heart, I have never, ever, ever copied a programme from another channel except when I was at Channel 4 and I copied a programme from Channel 5. What was that? <laughs> well, House Doctor was still performing very well on Channel 5 and <laughs> we created a show called Selling Houses, which was remarkably similar to um, <laughs> House Doctor. Well, what about tattoo disasters on Channel 5 and tattoo fixes no, on but, Channel 4? No, but <laughs> suddenly, but this is my point. We don't go and say, oh, let's copy Channel 4. These programmes come about because somebody goes in, oh, tattoos, and you go, yeah, you know what, that is of the moment. And then six months later, you're going, oh, they're doing it as well. Oh, they're doing it as well. You know, Love Island reality coming back again. Big Brother, you know, are we all copying each other? No. We it's look in at the zeitgeist, it. is what you're that's saying. What that's the phrase. Yeah. There are certain things that are in the zeitgeist. Yeah. And then there's blatant copying. I do not blatantly copy, and I don't know if other people blatantly copy. Um, but you've got to accept that there are things in the zeitgeist, mm. which means to a certain extent, there will be familiarities across, you know, competition. Competitive programmes, when Bake Off started, everyone went, oh, here's a new thing, Com competition programmes could be in, and the, 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 there's a plethora of them. I remember when I did Jamie's Kitchen, suddenly everybody was interested in, find somebody who can motivate young people, we'll take old prisoners and we'll, we'll make them all florists, or we'll take these kind of people and we'll turn them into this, and that was the kind of, you know, it, was the, it was the mood of the nation, so, um, yeah, anyway, okay. I do not copy. Okay. I'm too clever to copy other people. I'm too Except damn once. creative. I am too creative. I am. <laughs> well, let's and I couldn't down. live with myself. You know, I'm yeah. not going to get any satisfaction from lying in bed going, you know, that was it. You know what? Selling houses has never been on my CV. I'm embarrassed to, that I did that, <laughs> but I had a hole to fill. Uh, but, <laughs> but you know what? So I, don't take it, I wouldn't take any pride in, 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 in copying. Well, well, well let's I'm look at an creative. example now of your creativity. Yeah. And... Um, this is a, a program called Ganglands, and I'd just like you, before we play the clip, I just want you to explain a little bit about it so that the audience well, can understand. Well, I'm not sure this is an example of my creativity. This is an example of, uh, you know, Channel 5 can play with the big boys and, and do risky programmes. So a commissioner comes into me and goes, oh, you know, uh, we've got a chance to do this film where we, a uh, series where we are inside a gang, and I went, oh, gangs are a bit niche, I'm not sure about that. Go, OK, and, but this is different, OK, how is it different? Well, we're going to give the gangs cameras and they are going to film themselves. So nobody's going into the gang, no one's going undercover. We're going to drop cameras off outside a, a specified destination. They will take the cameras. I'm going, oh yeah, and how much is the insurance for this series? <laughs> and they will then deliver the footage and we will cut it together. Now, in one half of my head is going, 
it won't rate that well. That's quite niche. Gangs, that's not really our audience. Gangs is not a great word for how I'm going to market this show. Da, 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 da. And the other half of me is going, wow, that is really different. That is such an interesting idea. I love the idea of trying something with a so left field. I love the idea of doing something that I don't think anybody else has done before. And I weigh it up very quickly in my head and go, you know, how successful have our hit shows been? Have we got enough ratings in the bank for me to go to my scheduling team or, or you know, my um, bosses and say, look, this won't necessarily rate, but I think for reputation and for repositioning of the channel, it's a really important show. And I go, yes, we have. Let's commission this show. The creative risk there, far beyond giving the guys those cameras, but just editorially, editorially you know, the whole thing, you legally, know, glamorising gang, gang oh, yeah, and violence, yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and what would be your response to that? On, on my the response will be that I would go straight to my legal team and go, what is our position on this? What, what can we do? What can't we do? What mm. um, position should we take? You know, I, I, I am not an expert on all things legal mm. um, or indeed how you make television. Um, I, but, I hear a good idea mm. and we will discuss what are, the, what are the realities of this? You know, can we do this? Can't we do this? How can we do this? How can we not do this? No point in me spending the money and taking the risk if we then can't show the programme. But, they, you know, that, that's where you turn to other people's expertise sure, to, the, to help you I, make something. I completely understand this is the lawyer side. I suppose what I was asking was a broader question of is there a risk of because you're not having it um, mediated with a reporter or anybody there, uh, you're handing over editorial control to the gangs. I suppose and you can control editorial slightly in the editing. In of the it. editing, yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's almost part of the risk, is that you are mm. jumping off the cliff. You know, if, if it wasn't transmittable, we wouldn't be able to transmit it. So it's got to be legal and it's got to, you know, fit in various um, criteria. But that was part of the risk, is that you weren't having control. You couldn't mm. editorialise it as you went. You couldn't say, well, we're missing this bit and we need more of that bit and whatever it is. And that's, mm. that was really what made it feel different. I've got another project that I can't talk about, but it is equally risky and different in that you you have to jump off the cliff give what you need to give and allow people to do their jobs in the hope that in one year two year three years time you will get a piece of television back that is 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 surprising and um, rewarding so for people are looking to interest you in their ideas <clears throat> do you have an appetite for this i suppose you could call it kind of edgier style of content i have an appetite for anything that i think is is a good idea um, that is not a pedestrian idea, or that makes me, as the controller, go, that will rate, or that's a no-brainer, or that will solve a problem, or that's something that we should do because it hasn't been done, or that is a, a really clever idea that would make us look forward-thinking, or that is a great idea that I think people would say nice things about the channel because of, or that is a great idea because I can uh, use it to schedule against, you know, Bake Off or, you know, drama on ITV or whatever it is. So, you know, when people come in with ideas, um, you know, I sometimes say to them, you know, if you were sitting in my position, would you commission that and why would you commission it? But, but generally when I hear ideas, it's like a Rolodex that goes through in my brain very, very quickly. Mm. And I'm assessing very quickly what this idea that I'm being pitched, uh, of what use it might be to me and the channel or one of the digital channels. And it could be, and it could have a number of uses, or it could just have one very specific use. Um, the only criteria is it needs to have a use, and it needs to have a purpose for me to invest my money in it. So I think that's a very clear um, description of the kind of principles that behind your commissioning. Are there particular slots or things that you're looking for in 2017? Well, we mainly commission for 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock increasingly. I'd like to move into 11 o'clock. Um, I still think it's quite interesting, you know, the returnable... 8 o'clock and 9 o'clock show is the hardest thing to find in television. And in fairness, I have been asking uh, for new ideas for 8 o'clock and 9 o'clock for the last three budget rounds, and I have very, very, very few. It is the toughest um, uh, programme idea to find. The bulletproof idea, be it Can't Pay, Ben Fogel's New Lives in the Wild, Eamon and Ruth, that can deliver and deliver and deliver and deliver. I mean, um, uh, GPs last night did 900,000, including plus one, up against 10.5 million for Bake Off. That is a staggering number for GPs, which normally does just over a million. I mean, it shows that it's almost Teflon. It is an incredibly valuable programme to us. Mm. So those really strong returnable ideas are the ones that I really need. Because if I have a few more of those, 
I can put some of the other ones to pasture, or I can be less reliant on them and maybe not commission quite so many episodes. And I can refresh the schedule then with slightly riskier pieces that may not be so obviously a hit show, but that can evolve into a hit show. And, it's, and again, I'm going to go back to it. It's all about balance. But I've got to, have, got to bring the numbers in in order to allow myself permission to do things like Gangland. So what more would you like to see from production companies? What do, you know, what do they do that you like? What do they do that drives you crazy? Uh, I love it when they understand Channel 5. I love it when they really think about Channel 5 and the Channel 5 audience and the, and the sort of responsibilities of Channel 5. Um, I love being collaborative. I'm very, very happy. I've never said, never said no to a meeting. I will always meet with anybody, and I'm always happy to discuss. I had a wonderful hour with a person who runs a production company on their own, a single person, about two weeks ago, who I'd met in the, at the Sheffield Documentary Festival. She said, can I come meet you? Because you have a lot with smaller indies, don't you? I love smaller indies. 15% yeah. uh, of our budget goes on indies of, um, who have a turnover of less than five million. Um, and I like young, enthusiastic people. And this, this person came and we had a two-hour chat and we talked through some ideas and I talked about how she was pitching to me. And I, I found it actually a really rewarding experience. And I hope she found it a rewarding experience. And I hope one day we will work together. Um, so I love, uh, I, I love that. I don't like people who presume that they know more than I do or, or who are... Nobody dare do that, would they, or, Ben? Uh, they'd be foolish if they did. Um, <laughs> and that applies to my team as well, um, <laughs> who sometimes think they do. Uh, but uh, what I don't like is when I give money to an independent company and I don't get what I asked for. I don't mind if things go wrong. Things go wrong. I don't mind if sometimes things don't stack up. That happens. Sometimes you think you're going to get some great editorial and it's a bit weak, and you, you know, sometimes you have to turn the four-parter into the three-parter and just try and make the best content with what you've got. But I do have a problem when I pitched a program and I hand over my money and the program that comes back is not what I was pitched. Yeah, okay, fair enough. And do you think you get enough pitches from bigger indies? Uh, no, I don't. I think uh, I'm surprised at the... Uh, very few numbers of independents, especially those super indies, independents, uh, super indies who would come and talk to us. Yeah. Mm, totally. But there are some big indies who haven't even crossed my door in three and a half years. Mm. In fact, somebody uh, I met, a, a senior person, said, you know, I can't believe I haven't seen any of you know, these people um, underneath your super indie umbrella. And then, of course, I got the call from uh, one company saying, oh, you know, can we come and see you? And when they came in, I said, I've been here three and a half years and you've never called me, you've never emailed me, you've never been to see any kind of commission. They said, oh, no, we've sort of been busy. I said, if I was your boss, I'd have fired you. Your job is to go and get work. Your job is to try and bring the money in and develop programs and everything. And the fact that you've just dismissed Channel 5 for three and a half years, I think, if I was their boss, is unacceptable. Even though they might say, we're looking at the budgets at Channel 5, it doesn't There's no sense. problem with the budget. This perception about budgets at Channel 5 is just a distraction. You know, we have tariffs for, for slots. We have a vague idea of what we, you know, if, if 8 o'clock is 80k and 9 o'clock is between 100 and 150k, that means I can do 35 million hours a year or whatever it is. But that doesn't mean to say I, don't ha I, ca I can't spend 400,000 at 9 o'clock if I want to. It just means that I can't necessarily do quite as many hours of origination, or I might have to do five hours at 8 o'clock for 50k rather than 80k. You know, I've got very clever people around me who are able to move money around. We have never said no to a project since I've been here that I've wanted to do ever. And that's expensive project. You know, 10,000 BC was a very expensive project and it was 10 hours of television. And nobody batted an eyelid to me and said, you, we can't afford to make this programme and you shouldn't be doing this programme and da, da, da. We all decided we should do it and we found the money for it. Uh, and we will always find the money for a good idea. I might have to make a few compromises along the way going forward or whatever it is. But that doesn't mean to say it can't be achieved. You can always you know, move money into different years and different time slots and things like that. So this perception that we don't have money is wrong. We have a smaller budget than Channel 4, ITV, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that doesn't mean to say that we're frightened of big, ambitious projects. I'd like more ambitious, big, ambitious projects. Okay, I'm sure that's very interesting for our audience to hear. But let's go to the video wall now. And this question is from Pat Young. Ben, why do you think Channel 5 doesn't get the creative recognition it deserves? Because oh, people are snobs. Um, <laughs> I, I think there's still, uh, much less so, a little bit of history. Um, I think there are some people um, uh, who it sort of sticks in the craw that, that they should um, give Channel 5 the credit. Um, I think there's a, 
uh, a misperception that Channel 4 is not as original or creative or ambitious or as cool as some of the other channels. The, the viewers um, really very, very quickly um, after I came to the channel started to really like Channel 5. And I, I think our viewers have really noticed the changes and our perception amongst viewers and our uh, recognition and our reputation amongst viewers is really improved. Um, I think some people are lagging behind. I get deeply frustrated about it, sometimes very demoralised about it. Um, but I am reassured by people in the team that it will change and it is a, it is a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long battle I've got to go through. I will change people's perception of Channel 5 because it's a really good channel and I'm not going to go on and on and on like I did last year. But all I would say to people is look at what we do. Look at the range of programmes well, in the schedule would, and the quality of work that we do. Which you've described very well, look at the range of programmes, but I suppose when Celebrity Big Brother plays such an important yeah. part in your schedule, because it's on at the it's, moment... It's a tricky it, one. It, 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 yes. Yeah, it does There's define no the channel, doesn't yes, it, in many ways? Yes, it, it, it can. It's a, it, it, it's a big player in the channel. Um, and I think part of my, my key job next year is to find other key pieces that can play in the schedule that take a little bit of the spotlight off Big Brother. Uh, and also, I think yeah. this is a bit of an exceptional summer because you've had the Euros and then you've had the Olympics and we strategically played Big Brother at nine o'clock in order to uh, uh, protect ourselves against the Olympics. A very successfully show out of the three commercial channels, we were hit least mm. by this juggernaut um, right across the BBC. Um, so that was a strategic move in order to sort of, you know, shore ourselves up. In future, Big Brother will play at 10. Mm. Apart from maybe, maybe Celebrity will be at nine, but the civilian will play at 10 o'clock. And I'm much happier for me. Ideally, I'd have it at 11. It's mm. a bit expensive to play at 11 at the moment because I think it's a very valuable show to us. And I think, and I, you know, I think it's a really good show, but I, I, I would agree it can cast a bit of a shadow over some of the other stuff that we do. It's part, um, of the, part of the balance. It's a tough one sometimes. And then in terms of the creative recognition, I, mean, I think it's interesting to hear about you know, what happens inside Channel 5 and the fact that you, know, you have a, a small team of commissioners and you know, you, you deliberately foster a good atmosphere. You would try to do that. Yeah. Yeah, we know we've, there's very few of us. There's seven commissioners and there's some scheduling people and a little acquisitions team and me and everything. And, you know, and, and I think we punch very much above our weight. Um, and we all you know, love each other and we all hate each other. Um, we've got a slimming club. We've got a little slimming club going. I've lost, I've gone from 82 kilos to 73.6. <laughs> I weighed myself this morning. <laughs> Not that he's competitive at all. It's incredibly obviously. competitive. <laughs> it's incredibly competitive. I will win the competition. But, it, but the, the, seriously, you know, we, we motivate each other. And somebody says to me, oh, you know what? You can lose half a kilo if you have a hot bath the night before. And I'm going, great, I'll take that tip. Thank you very much, indeed. And I will weigh my clothes in the morning to see what I'm wearing for the weigh-in, which is on a Thursday morning. Um, <laughs> But you know, we you know, we sort of josh each other. But the idea is, is that we're all we're all kind of supporting each and, other. And I did hear rumours that you you might. Um, I think there's some kind of bet at work that you, you might be showing off your new body uh, at work. Yeah, there was a. Well, we were discussing it. So Gary Lineker presenting Match of the Day in his underpants was the most tweeted item last week. And uh, and I looked at Gary Lineker's body. So I've lost some weight. I'm doing my yoga and I'm not drinking. So you know. And I, looked, and I said to the team in the big programming meeting where we have about 30 people on the first one, I said, you know what, for an ex-football player, actually, my body's not that far behind Gary Lineker's. <laughs> you know. And so somebody said to me, so would you present this meeting in your underpants? And I said, well, if we can do better than we did in the very famous Project Ferrari week, yes, I will. <laughs> I will be given four days' notice if we achieve it, um, in which to just put the finishing touches to it. But um, <laughs> if there was ever, if there was ever a, 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 a motivation for, for not having a donut or that extra glass of wine, it will be that I might have to present that meeting in my underpants. But I would do it, because it'd be fun, wouldn't it? <laughs> di At least it would be different. It would certainly be it different. Would be different. Certainly and everyone different. would have a laugh, and they'd all go, I'm not yeah. as thin as I really thought I was, and everything. And then we'd all have a laugh. And, <laughs> you know, we work in entertainment, we work in, a tele in television, and, you know, I can be very grumpy, and I can be very silly and I can be very irreverent and everything. And I like when my team are, are not intimidated by me and we can all josh each other and support each other. We're there for the good times, we're there for the bad times. We have tough competition, we've got tough targets. You know, it's a bit of a battleground out there. And I like the fact that we all pull together. Sometimes we love each other, sometimes we all fall out. We're like a family. And there are good days and bad days. But you know what? I, I have a great, great, great team and I am deeply loyal to my team and I hope they're loyal to me. 
And well, if you've got any questions for Ben, do remember the app about his <laughs> underpants or whatever else you, you might, might be interested in. And we're going to go to the, some of those questions at the end. Uh, so that's Borderline, mm. a comedy that, mm -hmm. that was commissioned. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the story. Well, I think that this, is, this demonstrates the fact that, you know, you should never, you know, when people say, what are you looking for? Uh, you know, I might say, well, I'm looking for nine o'clock returnables. But, you know, I, I wouldn't say I don't want this and I don't want that. I think it's, it's wrong to be prescriptive. Um, when uh, Ralph Little and, and Zoe Rocha came in, um, just for a meeting about comedy, uh, about scripted comedy, I said, "Look, I'm not going to be in. I'm not going to do scripted comedy. Uh, we're not there yet. Maybe in two years' time, you know." Da, 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 da. But we had a lovely meeting. And they were very nice people, and they said as they went, "You know, could we send you something that we shot, you know, recently?" And I said, "Of course, you can send me something. Very happy to look at something." And the next day they did, and that popped up. And I said, "They went, oh, damn in hell! That is a really good idea. That is a really good idea to set a comedy." in the world of border control, given what's going on in the world it's at the very moment. Now, it's isn't it? very yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. And I sent it out to some of the team and I said, mm -hmm. I think there's something in this, do you? Mm -hmm. And uh, they came back and said, I think there's something in this. I said, I, there is, isn't there? Let's get him in for a meeting. Mm -hmm. So they came and I said, you know what? I, I did watch it and I think there's something in it and let's talk it through. You know what? Let's just do it. So we had two meetings and I commissioned this six part series. And I think it, it gives the example of A, the production company taking the initiative to go and shoot something themselves rather than waiting to get their foot in the door and then wanting development money and da 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 da, da. It's a bit like GPs last year. Jonathan Stadlin presented me with this tape that he'd gone and shot on his own. I looked at it and I went, that's a good idea. We should do that show. Exactly the same here. They went off off their own bat, shot this thing, impressed me, and we commissioned it. I might not want food at the moment. I'm not sure I want, you know, a competitive game show at the moment. I'm not sure I want a lot of things at the moment. But if somebody comes in with that great food idea, I would be insane to say no to it. So it's kind of like proof that all doors are always open. It really is ideas dependent. I'm not going to say I want two of those and one of those and five of those and six of that and I don't want any of that and I don't want any of those, they're over. You know, I say there are no benefits programmes and we're only going to be doing the big benefit handout going, going, going forward. But that doesn't mean to say that that area can't be revisited in a, in, in a different form or it can't be um, made into a different kind of television programme. So I don't like to be prescriptive. And I think for independent companies, it shows that, you know, you should have the courage of your convictions, you know, develop stuff up and come in and present me with what you think is a great idea. So you, you, would, you certainly would look then at genres outside factual? Mm -hmm. Well, we have moved. I mean, I, again, I think part of our, our responsibility is to do that. And we moved very quickly into comedy and entertainment. I think Viacom are a huge uh, support and influence on that, given Comedy Central and MTV. Um, they invested uh, in us last year. And we focused very much on 10 o'clock, um, borderline, it's not me, it's you, the funny side of, laugh out louds, lip sync battle. You know, these are programmes that even a year and a half ago, I would never have thought would have been on, on Channel 5. And some of them have come from Viacom programmes in the States, haven't they? Yes, like, lip sync like battle is, is, is yeah. a Viacom format, yeah. uh, Spike format, um, mm. which is obviously owned by, by Viacom. Um, and in Practical Jokers as well. And in Practical Ju Jokers UK. Um, Comedy Central. Yeah, it, it, yes, Comedy Central show. So mm. we've done the UK version of that. Um, so Viacom sort of help, helped persuade me to f fast track the area and almost in a way not to over analyze it and get myself too worked up about you know, if we do it and it doesn't work and how much money is it going to cost it was they gave me permission to just like try it so we did our sort of summer of comedy and entertainment which included all those shows plus Ryland's chat show and some other bits and bobs um, some of it's worked better than others uh, borderline has had probably after suspects the best reviews of my career um, which I'm delighted about. And, you know, we will now sit down and go, so how do we move forward? We can't get out of it now. We're in it, which, and we should be in it. Comedy, entertainment, all genres. We're a PSB. But now we work out, OK, what's our next move? And I think that'll be quite interesting for Channel 5. And what do you think, looking back now, about um, Late Night with Rylan? I think it was a great thing to do. He is a truly talented, amazing, and very, very, very nice person. Um, I was delighted we were able to pull it off. We'd been talking about it for months, so it was great that we could do it. It will come back in some form or other. I'm not sure it'll be stripped. You know, it's quite a tough gig, stripping something. But I really believe in Ryland. And in a way, I believe in, you know, help, while I can, nurturing Ryland in my way. Because going forward, I do think he will be one of the great television entertainers of this country. Probably not on Channel 5. Um, probably on ITV or the BBC. But that's fine. I don't mind helping him get there. I'm very proud to have had him on my channel so far and to give him his first real presenting break, which was a bit on the side. And Sue, so do you have any plans for more kind of joint products with, with Viacom using their formats 
um, for other programmes? Well, Viacom are very, very keen on, um, you know, uh, content is very important to them. Um, content that can play across other um, channels is very important, whether it's Spike UK, um, making programmes that can play on Spike on other territories, whether it's us making a comedy that can play on Comedy Central or Comedy Central, making comedies that can play on Channel 5, and there's MTV and Five Star have great synergies. Um, and I'm, I'm a great believer in content. And um, it's all, there's almost debate about young people, you know, I just want good ideas, but we do find that when we find those good ideas um, and they resonate, they can play across a number of platforms on Viacom. And I'm, they're keen for that, I'm keen for that. We all just want to be good at what we do. We all just want to be the channel that has great shows. And I'm very happy to take a programme from MTV or um, Spike or Comedy Central, and I think vice versa. We all benefit. OK, well, let's take another question now from the video wall. Um, it, let's hear from Jim Allen. Hello, Ben. Uh, basically, can I just make it perfectly clear we'd love to work with you, but my question is, um, Channel 5 is famous for outrageous titles. When you saw Budgies Make Me Laugh Out Loud in the listings, did you, one, laugh out loud, two, punch the air and say, that's Channel 5 for you, or three, weep a little bit inside? What was the last bit? We a bit inside? We <laughs> weep. <laughs> Wait, why? What's wrong with Budgets Make You Laugh Out Loud? <laughs> it's a good title. It, it was like the eight millionth Laugh Out Loud. We've done Kittens, Make You Laugh Out Loud to death. Kittens 32 we're on now. I mean, <laughs> this is funny because this, this idea came about when we were in a, in a, in a scheduling meeting and I keep teasing uh, Sebastian, who runs um, uh, Five Star, that he doesn't watch Big Brother because he was always watching cat programmes on BBC Two. And I said, you're a young boy, you shouldn't be watching cats, you should be watching sex on Big Brother or whatever, you know, <laughs> blimey. Um, and he said, you know, oh, I just love cats, you know, we should do a clip show with cats. I'm going, yeah, we should do that. Okay, what can we do? Let's do Cats Do the Funniest Things. So we did a clip show called Cats Do the Funniest Things and it rated through the roof. And then you kind of go, wow, we have struck a chord here. Let's do some more. So we changed the title and called them Laugh Out Loud with Dog Dogs, Puppies, Gerbils. And then I'm thinking, okay, what else? Are like rabbits, budgies, you know, toddlers, OAPs. And you, I, I mean, it just keeps hitting the mark and it keeps bringing in the young viewers and yeah. it's family friendly yeah. and you can schedule it all over the, all, all over the, um, the schedule, which is useful. So um, it's a kind of pragmatic title. Uh, and, and a very successful title for it. It's the laugh out loud bit that's the important thing. I mean, I, generally, I, I do like a, a, a title. Um, I like a title. It doesn't have to be a salacious title or a grubby title or anything like that. It has to be a title that stands out and makes people go, that sounds interesting, I think I want to watch it. And from the title, I kind of know what I'm going to get, and I like that feeling, therefore I will find Channel 5. Mm -hmm. Because it's a big old world out there, and there are all these new channels evolving, and there's you know, very competitive scheduling, and blah, blah. I'm not sure people read the Radio Times anymore to actually you know, work out what the programme is, and people have got a shorter attention yes, you've span. Got to you've got to grab them. You've got to grab them. Yeah. And we talked about this earlier, you've got to grab them on yeah. the title. So they, they like the title, they're going up and down the EPG. I mean, how many people go home and they just go up and down the EPG? What am I going? Oh, I like the sound of that. Then they're going to watch 10 seconds, they're going to go, God, I like the sound of it. I, you know what, I'm going to stay with it. Mm. If you don't get them, they'll simply go somewhere yeah, else. Absolutely. And, you know, that's part of the responsibility nowadays, is to make sure that your content is as robust and exciting and rewarding enough for people to A, want to watch it, B, watch it and enjoy it, and C, come back and watch it next week. Now, you've talked to us a lot about your, your plans for origination, how you've increased the budgets for that, but acquisitions are obviously still important. Mm. What kind of plans have you got for that for the future? Well, I think our plan for acquisition is, is to cherry-pick the pieces that are most useful to the channel. I mean, Channel 5 used to be very heavily reliant on acquisitions. CSI would double bank, you know, during the week. NCIS, The Mentalist, these were all, you know, persons of interest. They were all playing in the heart of primetime when I arrived. And they're all great shows, but if you're trying to redefine a channel and evolve a channel, you know, it's, it's not so helpful. Um, so we now put all our acquisitions essentially on a Saturday night, which provides a great alternative to all that big entertainment stuff on the other channels. Mm -hmm. um, X-Files, which we showed this year, has been the most successful ever acquisition in Channel 5's history. And it was perfect for us. It was like a stunt piece. It was six episodes. I do think that the, the days of the sort of 22-part series where you're paying a lot of money just on a pilot are questionable nowadays for us because if they don't work, it's a lot of money and it's a lot of weeks filled up and it, takes, it puts a lot of pressure on us budget-wise. But there will always be a place for acquisitions, um, especially because they can enhance the schedule so well. Interesting to know. And tell us about the schedule, what's coming up in the autumn, you're moving into new areas. 
Well, we're moving into that um, uh, more lifestyle-y kind of people taking control of their lives. We've got uh, with follow-up series to The Six Wives of Henry VIII, where we look at um, Elizabeth I over three hours, and it's basically all about Elizabeth and her enemies. We're following up um, uh, Loch Lomond with A Year in the Dales, and then we're doing a follow-on series from that from Alaska. Ruth and Eamon are back. You know, all the big hitters so are back. So natural history is, is important. Well, I think it's one of the genres that we wanted to um, rogue into. It was a bit of a risk when we did um, Loch Lomond, and nobody thought, well, we kept it on the shelf for a year. We thought nobody would watch it, and then it was one of the big hits of last year. Um, uh, so, you know... A lot of returning hits, but also new stuff. And I think the new stuff that comes through, it'll be very telling to see how it works. I hope we have the foundation pieces in place for them to work. I think uh, the way we've scheduled things like Carry On Caravanning, All It's Seen with Jay McDonald, you know, The Cars That Made Britain, things like that are quite interesting. On paper, it looks solid. The programmes are good. The competition is a fucking nightmare. But some of them will work, some of them will disappoint and just do all right, and some of them will probably fail. But that's the nature of the business. OK, and now time for our final question from the video wall. And I warn you, this time it's a bit personal. Let's hear what Jamie Isaacs has to say. He hates me. Ben, you've gone on record saying that a lot of the ideas you commission are actually your own ideas. Have you ever thought about starting your own indie? Yes. <laughs> think about it all the time. Oh, do you? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm far too insecure, and I'm really bad at taking rejection. And, I, you know, even in the worst <laughs> meetings, when people come in and they are pitching to me and I'm thinking, oh, my God, this is just like a brutal meeting, I just have to flip it around and go, how would you feel if you were sitting there and going, you know what, listen to them, you know, try and help them, try and make this meeting not as bad as it could be. Mm. I absolutely take my hat off, and I really admire all those people who have been brave enough to start up their own indies. Most of my peers um, went off and started indies, and they were all multi-millionaires. <laughs> and while... Is no, that they, annoying? <laughs> do you know what? While I would like to be much richer, I can never begrudge the fact that they got rich by being brave enough to start their own independent company, mm. because I think it is a deeply, deeply, deeply challenging job and a very tricky job, and I think that the more indies there are, the harder it gets. And I think that's why I feel so sort of protective and want to be support the smaller indies, because if they are brave enough to join that shark-filled pool where you're trying to grab what you can from whoever you can and just get a foot in the door and just get a meeting with somebody and just get a little bit of development and just get a chance to prove that you can do it, I, I, I really feel that we, we, we owe them all the help we can, we can mm. give. And it's a two-way street, you know. Then they deliver me a great project and I want to work with them again. As I said, the only thing that is... You know, a no-go area is when I don't get what I asked for. And um, I'd pretty question working with them again. But uh, I, I, do believe, uh, I do believe in helping smaller indies, and I, I take my hat off to them. I think it must be... God, you must be like Teflon to be rejected and rejected and rejected, and then just go, I'm going to keep, keep at it. I, I am not brave enough. So um, it sounds like you're, you're, you're not brave enough to set up an indie, but um, other big moves to you in the future, you're going to be moving to Camden, aren't you, in September? I've got the arm flare, I've got the tattoo. <laughs> it's all, it's all, I'm, I'm, I've got my funky shoes on. <laughs> Might get a toupee. I'm thinking about it. It's happening very soon. It's October. It's like, yes. oh, my God, yeah. Yeah. And so how do you feel about that? Well, I, you know, uh, I, I think it is absolutely the right decision for the business. You know, I think the, the, the more that we're together, the better the synergies can be and we can all be collaborative. It's fantastic. I will miss working in the city hugely. It's been a privilege to be in the very heart of the greatest city in the world, to see the Shard every day and St Paul's and the Thames and the Tower of London. I, and every day, however bad things are, I am inspired by my surroundings. But, you know, I've worked in worse places than Camden. I worked on an industrial estate on the edges of Dublin for five and a half years, and I still did good work. I mean, there wasn't even a shop nearby, so it will be a shock to me. There's no doubt... And will it be moving into a more corporate culture? I mean, you'll be yeah. much more closely yeah, with Viacom yeah, with your bosses. Is, and that yeah. is going to be a challenge for me. I'm not a very corporate person. I'm going to have to uh, learn to um, bite my tongue sometimes, certainly. Um, you know, it, it's, going to be, it's going to be a big learning curve for me. There's no doubt about it. But I, you know, in a simplistic way... As long as, if I can, can keep delivering the content and keep delivering success for Channel 5 and keep growing Channel 5 and its digital channels, I like to think they will be a little forgiving of my individuality. 
Mm. And when, when you and then the day I don't deliver the ratings, they can fire me. <laughs> I mean, Shane Smith last night, I know you weren't at the McTaggart, but he was talking about the big picture. He said that Viacom was, it was imploding. I mean, how much attention do you pay to what happens to your parents? I, 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 it's none of my business, really. It's all happening uh, amongst people who are way, way, way more senior than me. And we obviously know what's been going on over the summer. Um, we, 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 you know, we followed the stories, but it didn't affect us in our day-to-day -day job at all. Um, I've made it abundantly clear in various things that I really concentrate on the day job. I'm glad it's resolved. I hope now we can draw a line underneath the distractions and keep moving forward. But, uh, you know, it didn't affect me, and I, I wait to see if it does affect me. OK, then we're going to move on to the app questions in just a sec. But one last question for me, which is Channel 5 has been nominated for Channel of the Year. Congratulations. Last year, though, you said you'd rather not be nominated yeah. than nominated and not win. Yeah. So what, what, do you, what do you think now? Well, I don't think we'll win. Um, I don't think we'll win. Um, and I uh, will not be going to the Channel of the Year uh, party because I, when Jamie's Kitchen was nominated for every award and I went to those endless dinners, thinking we're going to win this one, we're going to win this one, we're going to win, and we didn't win any of them. I made a decision never to go to a awards ceremony ever again unless I know I'm going to get the gong. Because it was so humiliating to sit there with all my peers going, huh, he thought he was going to win and he didn't. Uh, it was just mortifying. So, I, I mean, personally, I think we deserve Channel of the Year. I think if you look at the journey that Channel 5 has taken in three and a half years, the breadth of content, the quality of content, the risks we have taken, the way that we now cover all genres. I think we deserve Channel of the Year, but we all know that you don't always get what you deserve in life. OK, lovely. Well, I think we've got some nice questions from the app, actually. Has Channel 5 ever thought of doing a pilot season where viewers could vote for, what, for which show got commissioned? Uh, I like the idea of a pilot season. They do want a very successful pilot season on RTE in Ireland, actually. Oh, I think, yeah. um, where which, you worked, of course, in Ireland. Yeah, Island. which yeah. is a really, really, really good idea. I wouldn't necessarily have viewers voting. Um, I mean, they can vote by the ratings, but in, as, as, as in terms of online voting, as we know from the app thing this morning, it doesn't always work. And I, I, you know what? It's like focus groups. I don't like them. You know, they don't really understand the thinking behind things. Mm -hmm. So pilot season, great. Viewers voting, not for me, thank you very much. It's okay. a bit like the Big Brother winner, you know? Yeah. They don't always get it right. <laughs> OK. Um, on commissioning, do Viacom take all rights? No, they don't take all rights. Um, I do think uh, that if, I mean, we, we sort of have, as I understand it, sort of fairly standard rights, um, sort of similar to other broadcasters. Um, I do believe that if we create content, if I come up with an idea or a thing, we should get a bit more of the back end. And uh, that's only fair. Uh, and I do think that um, with the UK cluster, uh, the Nordics and Poland, it makes sense that Five Star, in particular Five Star and Spike programmes, should have those rights, the Nordics and Poland's included. Um, but for me, it's very important. It is a two-way street. We're a broadcaster, and the independent companies are our life's blood. Without the independent company, we have no comp competition, uh, uh, sorry, uh, any, any content. So there's no point in demanding X, Y, and Z, and then finding you've got 50% of nothing because nobody wants to work with you. Mm. It is very important that we keep our doors open, that we are respectful, collaborative, um, and good to work with. I want people to want to work with us. I want us to be a place that is easy to work with, a pleasure to work with, supportive to work with, and that we will do our very best to make sure your programme delivers on what we wanted to do so that we can work with you again. So um, there may be negotiations and there may be discussions about rights. It should be on an individual basis, in my opinion, um, depending on the project, depending on what we really want from it. Um, the most important thing is that the independent and Channel 5 are both happy and want to continue to work together. Because without the independence, we're nothing. I mean, I'm good, but I'm not that good. <laughs> <laughs> OK, now, you stated last year you were taking a big look at Big Brother with CBS announcing a digital edition of Big Brother US. What's next for the UK show? Um, I do think Love Island uh, gave us a little bit of a jolt this year, uh, you know, and it's no bad thing. Um, I think, you know, they've got the two-week head start, which made me fucking angry, frankly. And then, of course, because of the Euros, we were playing it at 9 o'clock and they were at 9 o'clock and whatever. And, it, you know, there's no denying it, Love Island was very successful for ITV. Um, Big Brother is 17 years old. It'll be 18 years old next year. Is it next really? Year. Gosh, yeah, I yeah, yeah. Sweet, yeah. yeah. It's still going. I always said when I came to Channel 5, I just, I just don't want to be the person who doesn't kill Big Brother. You know, so this current series we're in is up four share points on last year, which is great. Mm -hmm. And the summer was up 
two share points or something. Anyway, so it's all good so far. But I do think that it's um, we owe it to the viewers really to be brave enough to go. How can we reposition this for the future? How can we keep surprising the viewer? How can we take something that is a great premise, filming people 24 hours a day, and what can we do with it going forward? So I would like to have that really big, brave, bold, blue sky editorial discussion with the makers of Big Brother. After this series is finished and we've all recovered from Bear's antics and go, OK, in January it starts again. What could we do that would make us leaders? Big Brother has been the number one reality show in this country for 17 years. I do not want to be second. I want to keep being a leader in terms of reality. Uh, and another one from the app, with next year being a big year for Channel 5, its 20th anniversary. Mm. Is anything special being planned? Would love to see specials of original Channel 5 shows like 100% uh, Night Fever, The Mole. Well, we're thinking of a couple of um, reviving, after all the controversy this morning, <gasps> poor Charlotte, um, of reviving a couple of old Channel 5 hits, you know, to celebrate our 20th. Um, it's our 20th, isn't it? Yeah, 25th. 20th, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, we're looking at a couple of countdowns. I think we probably won't do uh, Channel 5's most shocking moments because you'd need more than three hours. Um, <laughs> but we have launched an incredible amount of talent. Did you know Idris Elba started off in Family Affairs on Channel I 5? I didn't. I remember Family Affairs. I remember and, of course, so Graham good. Norton started on Channel 5, mm. etc. You know, and, and George Clark started on Channel 5, and the hotel inspector Ruth, Ruth Watson started on Channel 5. So I think we might do something about, you know, what Channel 5 has done for British television, because... Uh, we've actually done quite a lot, and then maybe it doesn't get noticed enough. Yeah, big changes in news, of course. Big course, changes course, in course, news, course. yeah. We were the first Declare people to purge. Yeah. Another question, do you commission outside of budget rounds? Uh, well, if a great idea comes along and it's time sensitive, of course. And we'd be a fool to, you know, not bite, uh, you know, not, 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 not bite, bite the hand off. Um, but I think budget works quite well. You know, quarterly is just about right. Um, we're making it slightly more uh, streamlined this year in that I, I think it was, it was getting a bit bogged down. So we've tried to streamline A, the commissioning process and B, the follow-up afterwards so that we can sort of get them into production as quickly as possible. I think one of the criticisms from the um, Indy uh, survey was that we got a little... Um, we were a little slow and we could be faster, so we simplified that right down. I think quarterly is about right, but if somebody comes in and they're sitting in the room and they're going, I've got this idea... I'm not going to say I'm really sorry, but, you know, you've got to wait three months before you can, you know, I can yeah, take that one. Yeah, it's too bureaucratic, you know, and, yeah. and we are small enough to be able to go and make it happen very, very quickly without a lot of bu bureaucracy. And the next one, are there any plans for more original drama series following Suspects? Any scripted dramas planned? Yes, we will do some scripted drama next year. I mean, I think we'll, it'll be limited because there's obviously a lot on ITV and the BBC and increasingly Channel 4 and... You know, where are we going to schedule it? And there's no point in throwing good money after something that's just going to sit on the shelf for ages. Um, Suspects has been such a great success for us. I'm so proud of it. Um, now I think it's time to jump in the pool of scripted drama. And it's something I know nothing about. So it's going to be quite an interesting experience. Um, do you sometimes provide development money for producers to work up ideas? Absolutely. Like right, yes. Absolutely. We, we uh, but like but, it, but it's really about you, proof. Of, it's, but it'll be yeah. about proof of concept or casting. You know, it's a great idea, I really like it, but I don't believe you can really make it. You know, mm -hmm. here's five grand, ten grand, go and prove to me you can do it. So we're doing this uh, piece called uh, Me and My MP, which is where we're following Nick Clegg and various other MPs as they do their surgeries. Um, now, I thought it was quite an interesting idea, good way of looking at politics and the people, that kind of thing. I developed, they, they did a development for me, they went and did proof of uh, concept. When they came in and showed it to me, Although my brain was going, golly, this, you know, no one's going to watch this programme, and da, 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 da. I couldn't then not commission it because they'd absolutely proved that they could give me what I'd asked for. So um, I'm not going to give development money just for the sake of giving, I do need something back for it. But uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. And very easily too. I'm sure that's encouraging to hear. What impact has the acquisition of Neighbours and Home and Away had on the channel? Blimey. Well, they've been there so long, I've no idea. I mean, it's been, they've been going forever. Neighbours is on fire at the moment. Home and Away is a life of a serious deal. I'm really, what I like about Neighbours is, yeah, I mean, I don't know how long it's been on the channel. Um, obviously came from the BBC. Skew's very young, but also incredibly upmarket. It is one of our most upmarket programmes. You know, and again, it sits there and it does a great job for us. One of my jobs is to keep it fresh, so each year we look for a primetime stunt. And at first, it was kind of laughed at, you know, what, you're going to play Neighbours at 10 o'clock. It has worked really well for us. So we're looking to do something even bigger with Neighbours next year. It'll never be as big as Coronation Street or Emmerdale or EastEnders, but in its own way, it's an incredibly valuable pro programme to the channel. 
And finally, we come on to a question which I have to say I once asked uh, David Cameron and David Davis when they were vying for the Conservative leadership. Uh, perhaps there's inevitability about this. Why fronts or boxers? <laughs> I don't know what they're called. They're from COS, they're £10, <laughs> and I look bloody gorgeous in them. <laughs> I'm sure you do. I'm sure you do. So I think we're all going to have to hope that Channel 5 beats Channel 4 for a whole week in order to see this lovely vision, which I hope you will uh, tweet. Anyway, I just wanted to say thank you very much indeed uh, uh, to Ben, to all of you. Those are great app questions, actually, which you don't always get in these sessions. And I most of all have to thank our sponsor, Broadcast, for the session. But, of course, Ben Frau himself. Thank, thank you, you very much indeed.